Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Blogatas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, uh, chapter and verse. And we are still in the Book of Psalms. Uh, we're in the 101 to 125 grouping of Psalms, and so we're starting in Psalm 110, which I do have uh, the last part of verse 6 highlighted out, um, just because that's uh, graphic language, and I don't know if you have a little listening ears with you, but you're more than welcome to read that yourself. In fact, I highly encourage you to. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've got we're getting into some shorter psalms, and so chances are we're going to hit quite a few on our way through to the longest psalm and also longest chapter in the Bible, which is Psalm 119, um, which I'm looking forward to getting there. It's a very very excellent psalm, and all of these are. You know, it's all God's word. It's all useful. Uh, for instruction and reproof. Amen. So uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll just jump right in. So Father, I thank you for the Psalms. I thank you that they are a source of great inspiration. Um, as a musician, they mean a lot to me to know that all these words that we are reading uh, are were, were in the form of melody to you, Father God. It, uh, uh, it's a very uh, refreshing way to express our relationship to you uh, through song, and I just thank you for it. I ask, Lord, that uh, you would uh, bring out to our uh, to our, our attention the things that you desire us to know out of these words uh, that are uh, desirable for us to know right now, and those things that will be most relevant to us now, where we are here in this time. And I thank you for these things, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Okay, Psalm 110, a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. You will rule over your enemies. When you go to war, your people will serve you willingly. You have, are arrayed in holy garments, and your strength will be renewed each day like the morning dew. Uh, and so this is a uh, what we call a messianic prophecy you know it's about it's concerning Jesus uh, Jesus himself uh, specifically pointed out this psalm when he was talking to the the Pharisees and, and he asked them the question well who, what about what about the Messiah whose son is he and they said he's the son of David now Jesus asked them that question because they had been saying that that was um, a doctrine if you will where, that they had um, that they had taken to heart and they talked about how Jesus heard I mean how the Messiah was going to be the son of David because it's obvious that he comes through the line of David. So that's why they would, that's why they called him the son of David. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's very interesting, uh, that Jesus brought that up to them because he asked them, okay, well, if, if the Messiah, uh, he, he said, he said, he said, David speaking under the inspiration of the Holy spirit. That's when he, he quoted this Psalm. He said, if he said, the Lord said to my Lord, he said, how can the Messiah how, how, how can the, uh, the, the Messiah, uh, or how, uh, if he's the son of David, how then uh, can uh, he be his Lord, you know, is, is what he was saying. And so he was like, how is that possible? He wasn't saying it's impossible. In fact, it is possible. Through God, all things are possible. But they couldn't answer the question. And uh, so the Lord said to my Lord, so the Father said to the Son, sit in the place of honor at my right hand. Now again, God was speaking in a mystery because he didn't want uh, the enemy to understand his plan. The Bible says in the New Testament that if, if Satan had known, he wouldn't, they would not have taken the steps that they took uh, in, in the heavenlies, inciting people against Jesus to put him to death. If they had known God's plan, they wouldn't have, Satan wouldn't have carried it out. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have, uh, you know, worked on his end to cause the crucifixion to come about because he did. Because he, because you've got to remember, we have a spiritual enemy working behind the scenes, inspiring people to do wrong things. And so you, you have um, the, the religious spirit, we call it a religious spirit, but that, that the Pharisees had that they, they didn't, they, they had a certain idea of what the Messiah should look like. And when Jesus came on the scene, they didn't like it. And it wasn't just the Pharisees. And it wasn't all the Pharisees, because there were Pharisees that were not in agreement with what happened to Jesus. There were some Pharisees that followed him. and But then there was also the other religious leaders, the Sadducees, 
and then the, the council, the the Sanhedrin, the seventy, the civil elders that that held court, you know, and so they all, you know, or or parts of that those groups uh, did not like Jesus, and so yielded to the the uh, the influence of the enemy to have him be put to death. The same as there were leaders in the secular world that that did the same thing that didn't like Jesus, and and they contributed. They all they all can contributed to the crucifixion and satan also had a part to play in it because he was influencing them to, to move forward in it he thought that he had won and jesus when he, when jesus came to the pit uh after three days he took the keys of of sin and death or of hades and death and satan had no longer has power over people in that way through Jesus, they have everlasting life. Jesus took those keys, defeated Satan completely, and then rose from the dead. And, and so, but, uh, you know, th it's just interesting that you have this, this messianic psalm or this prophecy that uh, gives a, a partial view of the reign of the Messiah. And not only the reign as a king, but also the reign as a priest. Because he says here, uh, yeah, verse three, when you go to war, your people will serve you willingly. Yeah, how vital it is that in a war, everyone follows the chains of command, the chain of command. Yes. And so then you are arrayed in holy garments and your strength will be renewed each day like the morning dew. That speaks to his kingly office. But then in verse four, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And uh, so the book of Hebrews goes to great lengths to explain this. And we'll get there. We haven't got to the book of Hebrews yet. But uh, just a kind of a precursor to that, Melchizedek was not a priest in the, the line of Aaron. Okay, so you've got uh, that uh, Levitical priesthood because Aaron was a descendant of Levi, uh, one of the, the 12 patriarchs, one of the sons of Jacob. And so through that tribe then, the priestly office was instituted under the law. But Melchizedek lived before that. He lived in the time of Abraham. And Abraham met him, and it said that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, that's ancient Jerusalem. He was the king of that ancient city, and uh, which Salem, peace, you know, uh, uh, it, it, the, the word itself is a blessing, shalom. Uh, so there's a there's a you know a, a, a connection there, but then so but he's the priest of Salem or the king of Salem, but he's also the priest of El Elyon, God Most High. Well, Abraham was serving El Shaddai, okay, and El Shaddai is the, is one of God's titles, but El Elyon is also one of God's titles. So God Most High, and and El Shaddai, the God of, the God of uh, more than enough. I can't you know I, I um, God Almighty, that's that's El Shaddai, and so Abraham is serving God Almighty. Uh, Melchizedek is serving God most high and Abraham recognizes we're serving the same God but Melchizedek is a priest to God most high and so but but again you know in the book of Hebrews it talks about how Melchizedek from a uh, scriptural standpoint doesn't seem to he doesn't have a beginning and an end there's no there's no time he's mentioned when he's born there's no time when he's mentioned when he dies so God takes that application of eternity that applies to Melchizedek only in that sense because of course he was a flesh and blood man and he did die but we don't have the record of it and so that's why God takes that and he applies it to Jesus and says you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek you know you you in other words he he serves uh, as a priest in a in a wider capacity than the Levitical priesthood did because again Melchizedek uh, was you know, it's that general revelation in which he served, and the general revelation is greater than the specific revelation through Abraham, because uh, that that revelation serves as a light to the to the world. But everybody had a, 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 a in the world has a distant knowledge of Noah, through whom uh, Melchizedek has that a knowledge of God, and so there's that general. And I mean, this may seem extremely complicated. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Jesus is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He has no beginning. He has no end. So therefore, he is a high priest forever. And he is our high priest. So not only is he our high king forever, he is also our high priest forever. And so this is awesome. So verse 5, the Lord stands at your right hand. He's talking to Jesus to protect you. He will strike down many kings when his anger erupts. And so, you know, we like to 
to say, well, you know, when we ask for God's protection, we sometimes, you know, stop at the physical protection. But he's talking about spiritual spiritual protection because, yeah, he, he if 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 he was only talking about physical protection, that means he failed Jesus because Jesus did go to the cross and die a physical death. But that's not the kind of protection he's talking about. He is talking about a a a protection of his existence because our existence goes beyond our physical death. And so, uh, verse 6, he will punish the nations, verse 7, but he himself will be refreshed from brooks along the way. He will be victorious, talking about Jesus. Amen. And he is and he will be. So, chapter 111, praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them, meditate upon them, upon his deeds. Not only for us personally, but also what he's done for others and what he's done throughout history. Verse 3, everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. So none of his deeds are bad. All of his deeds point to his excellence and the excellence of his character and who he is. Verse 4, he causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our God, our Lord, excuse me. Verse 5, he gives food to those who fear him. He always remembers his covenant. That means that there will be times when it seems like he does not remember, but he always remembers. In other words, he always honors his covenant in the long run. He always honors it. Verse 6, he has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. All he does is just and good, and all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awe-inspiring name he has. So we have all these elements. His name, uh, the ransom paid, everything. Um, it, all, it all works together to form his plan. Verse 10, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise him forever. And I love that, you know, growing in wisdom as a result of continually obeying his commandments. You grow in wisdom. Chapter 12, praise the Lord. How joyful are those who fear the Lord. And again, whenever it says praise the Lord, it's hallelujah. Hallelujah literally means praise the Lord. So how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed um, those are so there are people who obey God's commands out of necessity and because it's the right thing to do but then there are people who delight in obeying his commands and they have a special promise uh, their children will be successful everywhere an entire generation of godly people will be blessed verse 3 they themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever those are the ones who delight in obeying his commands so it's a promise meted out in time. Verse 4, light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. Such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will not, excuse me, will long be remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. That's a key thing in life. Don't fear bad news. Don't dread that. You know, I mean, pe people are doing that. I mean, they check the headlines all the time. Is it bad news? Is it bad news? Or they just c shut it completely and shut it out because they're afraid of the bad news that they're going to read about. Or, you know, um, not saying that you have to read the news, but I'm just saying that there's a principle here, you know, where, I mean, when people, when people come and talk to us, are we afraid that they're going to be, they're going to bring bad news, but it's not, it's not within the character of the righteous to fear bad news. God dealt with me, you know, about um, along this line a long time ago because I didn't like to uh, do, con you know, I didn't like to conduct business, didn't like to go to the bank and talk to the bank teller, didn't like to talk to, you know, just didn't, you know, and it, and the the continual uh, resistance to doing that eventually led to an anxiety and a fear of talking to people in authority and talking to, you know, but yet God told me one time. Um, when I had to go into the bank and, and talk to the teller, I, had to, I was like, I don't want to do it. I'd rather just walk out. And he said, 
he reminded me of a proverb, and he's, he's done this different times in my life, but he reminded me of a certain proverb in the book of Proverbs that says, uh, the, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so he t it, it, I understood what, what he, he said, is anyone pursuing you? And it's like, well, no, no one's pursuing me. So if I had gone into that bank and just out of fear, to out of talking to the teller, had just turned around and walked out, then I would have been pursuing when no one, or I would have been fleeing when no one was pursuing me. And so basically what he was bringing, he wasn't accusing me, but he was saying, why act like the wicked? If you were the righteous, if you had been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, don't act like the wicked by pursuing when, or by fleeing when no one's pursuing you. You know, so don't fear bad news, you know, because it's just news. It's just, it's just, it's just another opportunity to say, I don't care what the bad news says. God's word says this, and I will live by his word because he is my king, not the bad news. The bad news is not my king. The bad report is not my king. Jesus is my king, and he brings good news, and he brings uh, promises that are good and true. All his acts are righteous. All his acts are just. Amen. So, um, Verse 7, they do not fear bad news, that's the righteous, they confidently trust the Lord to care for them through the bad news. That's the uh, that's what it's saying here. Verse 8, they are confident and fearless and can face their foes tri triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. The wicked will see this and be infuriated. They will grind their teeth in anger. They will slink away, their hopes thwarted. Yeah, because they're looking to do things they shouldn't be doing. You know, and so they uh, they come against God's people, but in the end, their all of their, their schemes will be thwarted. So then, uh, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Yes, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Everywhere. From east to west, praise the name of the Lord, for the Lord is high above the nations. His glory is higher than the heavens. And so praise itself, you know, I mean, because it can seem rep repetitive. It's like, you know, we hear it again, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so we can, we can begin to devalue that in our mind. But the Bible says that God has ordained praise. And, and you know, I, I looked up the word ordain, and uh, there's it, it comes from an old French word, you know, but there's ordained and there's the word ordinance you know and so uh the word ordain stands for like a a decree like a like a civil or a, you know a public decree and the word uh ordinance stands for uh outfitting of military um you know uh, uh you know military uh um uh, things okay uh, and so that but that but they both come from the same root word and so for uh for you know as as those words kind of split uh we begin to think of them separately but they're really the same thing they come from the same root word and so for god to say that he has ordained praise and so i was talking to a, a former marine and and uh, she had she said that's interesting that you bring that up she said because she said her brother uh, he de worked in ordinance in the military, and he, he he was responsible for outfitting military planes with the big machine guns and the missiles and the ordin it's it's ordinance. Okay, so then because God has ordained praise, He has made praise powerful in the spiritual sense, and so praise in and of itself is not powerful, but God has ordained it. So He has He has outfitted it with ordinance. Okay, so it's like, but but yet again, um, I might have a military plane and it might be outfitted with ordnance, but if I don't use that ordnance, it's of no effect. And so I need to, or it doesn't do me any, any, any benefit, but see if I am uh, understanding that my praise has been ordained by God, that it is an ordinance, he has outfitted it with great power in the spiritual realm. It, it's not that I myself am powerful. It's that he has made praise powerful for his own purpose and his own desires. And so when we praise God, things happen in the heavenlies that we are not aware of, and we don't need to be aware of it. We just need to praise God because the Bible says praise God, and because God has ordained praise for a purpose. So we need to act upon it. So in other words, 
you know, I mean, I've heard people sing things like my praise is a weapon. Yeah, but it's not a direct weapon that I am wielding. It's a weapon that God is wielding in response to my obedience to praise him. <laughs> okay, so when you understand how this works, it's not my word that's powerful, it's God's word. So if I speak his word, his word has power, but it's not because I have power, it's because God's word has power. It's because God is doing it, not me. But yet I am obedient to co-labor with him in the things that he has chosen me, or he has, he has called me to co-labor with him in. If he is telling me to speak my testimony, to win people to Jesus, it's it's him that makes that powerful, not me. If he tells me to praise him, then I will praise him. If he tells me to pray and make intercession, I will pray and make intercession. And because I am being obedient to his word, he causes his word to have great effect. Amen. So we have to understand these things. So let's not let praise become a repetition let's say, okay, I'm going to remember the things he's done for me and I'm going to praise him for those things and then he is going to do great things that's beyond my understanding. Amen. So, verse 5, Who can be compared with the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? He stoops to look down on heaven and on earth. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, even the princes of his own people. He gives the childless woman a family, making her a happy mother. Praise the Lord. Psalm 114. How am I on time? Just want to make sure that we're good. All right, Psalm 114. When the Israelites escaped from Egypt, when the family of Jacob left that foreign land, the land of Judah became God's sanctuary, and Israel became his kingdom. The Red Sea saw them coming and hurried out of their way. The water of the, now did that actually happen? No, God caused it to happen. But it's a it's a figurative it's a it's a it's a po, it's a poetic uh, way of putting it. You know, to to get the people to understand that because God has made them His people, they have standing, they have value. Okay, that's that's what the, it's it's as if the Red Sea fled. It's if it's as if the obstacle fled because of who God has made them. That's what this is illustrating here. So verse three, the Red Sea saw them coming and hurried out of their way. The water of the Jordan turned away because the the, the waters of the Jordan were also split when the people crossed over into the Promised Land. Verse four, the mountains skipped like rams and hills like lambs. What's wrong, Red Sea? That made you hurry out of their way? What happened to Jordan River that you turned away? Why mountains did you skip like rams? Why hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. He turned the rock into a pool of water. Yes, a spring of water flowed from solid rock. So then all of creation bends to the will of God. And uh, by extension, um, God, the presence of God's people has an effect on the natural world because he himself resides among them. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these psalms that give us such encouragement. I thank you, Lord, that you will have your way and you will have your plan and we can be a part of it and right at your side, right at your right hand as we see things unfold. And I thank you for these things. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys and we will see you again.